I just thought to myself, I'm not usually allowed to wear football shirts to press junkets, but today, <laughs> not only am I at home, but also it's a football show. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to run with it. And have you done bread? Have you cooked any bread yet? I haven't done any bread for I haven't yet. I've not joined the, the sourdough revolution. I kicked off. I kicked off hard with the bread. I've never done any baking before in my life. I did some hot cross buns, some pita bread. Then I did a loaf. And then about three, about four weeks ago, I was like, oh, fuck this. I'm, I'm really enjoying how the, the, uh, the messaging at the moment about the coronavirus, they've sort of assumed that everybody's real dream a real little treat for everyone is to do daily exercise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. And I also, when they say that thing about, oh, you can now exercise with your family, you think, well, I've never, I've never done any exercise <laughs> ever with my family before. So I'm going to begin, by the way, with like the official interview starting. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the show. I was, oh, I thought it was really, Thank really you. funny. I mean, anything to do with really long ball sacks makes me, or foreskins, I should say. Um, <laughs> Right away, and I thought, yeah, that's got your, your guy's stamp all over it. <laughs> that's a compliment. Yeah, um, just was wondering first about what do you sort of where the the idea sort of came from for this. I know it's sort of sort of just a generic question, but I just I guess I meant was it something that's been with you quite a while? Was this this kind of idea of getting into the kind of culture of football from behind the scenes something that you guys had talked about for some time? Yes, we started talking about it during the second in betweeners, I think, and um, second series. And I went on a flight to see my then girlfriend, now wife in America. And I sat next to a professional player. And, you know, I played loads of football and I'd seen loads of football and season ticket and everything. And I was like, well, I think I know about football. And then, and then we got talking over 11 hours, really. And it was so interesting what he was saying. There were so many things I didn't know about and I hadn't talked about. And, you know, his life was so fascinating to me. And I came back from America and, and spoke to Damon about it. And I think we felt like, you know, having written one thing about young masculinity, if you like, there was something to be written about a slightly older masculinity. And so we, we were thinking of a sort of workplace comedy and then actually something, oh, actually, well, a, 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 there aren't many, you know, well, there are a lot of majority male environments, but there aren't sort of exclusively male environments left. And I think it felt like the dressing room was a good version of a, an older version of a uh, school sick form common room in a way. So that kind of, that was what, what got us starting about it, started thinking about it. Well, I was going to say, I think with the in-betweeners, we kind of, we really had spent a lifetime thinking about suburbia. You know, we, we knew it inside out and we knew what we were writing there. And we wanted to find something that we had a similar relationship with all our life as writers, which was football. But we didn't quite have that 360 degree kind of view of it. So we, we, we could know it as far as being a fan and being obsessed and being entitled and all the terrible things that come along with being a fan and being disappointed. But we, we were really keen to explore what it was like on the other side of the curtain, really, just getting a peek into their lives. And sort of, you know, the suspicion was it can't all be everything that you read about and the perception of footballers because uh, they would all be far too unhinged to play football and, and work in a team. And the reality of it is, of course, it's a very, very professional industry. People have dedicated their whole lives to it. Um, it just so happens that, uh, you know, if they make any mistakes, they're scrutinised in a way that nobody else would be. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword for them, this, you know, the dream of playing football. Yeah, because I think one of the things that makes British comedy and sitcoms so good, and it's something that the in-between has thrived in as well, is this kind of appreciation of failure that we have over here. I mean, if you look at kind of American sitcoms, it's usually, <laughs> it's a celebration of triumph, but we kind of celebrate the opposite. We like, um, you know, if you look at like the David Brent or Alan Partridge and, and you're the four guys from the in-between, it's all about the kind of, the, 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 there's something about them that's very normal, very relatable, um, and it is to do with failure. And, and I'm just wondering about how you access that theme with professional footballers because these aren't DJs for North Norfolk radio or managers of paper firms in Slough these are really successful people I was just wondering about how you kind of used the kind of traditional kind of theme of failure in British comedy and infiltrated it into in football which is by nature of the complete opposite I think it's about I think all those things and I think you're right about the American stuff but I think it's about emotional failure isn't it it's about an inward looking problem it's about yourself it's not about what you materially succeed in and about insecurity. And again, I think the, the thing that Partridge and Brent definitely have in common is, is massive insecurity. You know, and so they give a projection. of, And so actually that manifests itself eventually in their failure professionally. But it doesn't, it doesn't go away. And I think that's the thing with these guys is that it's about 
hopefully we're writing about their inner lives and how that expresses itself right and, and what that means in terms of being a successful failure rather than you know financial terms yeah and the jeopardy that exists as well so there's this huge like you know we're, we're talking about a bubble of elite um, professional sports and huge privilege and people that are incredibly enabled in their lives you know people run around and do everything for them but that can all go very quickly you know if you make mistakes and really it's about how I guess the show is about following three young footballers trying to navigate their way you know through that will uh, make sure that their careers aren't destroyed before they're even started and they're, they're doing this all the while while being you know uh, exposed for the first time to the the first team squad and all the like any workplace there's these internal um, divisions and pressures that exist and it's not a harmonious place in fact it's a shit show you know in the dressing room if if newspapers were writing about this dressing room you know it'd be back page stuff you know they're all pulling in different directions and the team's going to pieces and results are going from worse to worse so we we, that's where we found, you know, all the tension exists still, despite the fact that all these people are incredibly privileged. Um, that's for us, I guess, one thing we've always talked about is male insecurity as well. That that kind of drives a lot of the comedy, you know, so it doesn't really matter whether you're, uh, you know, earning £50,000 a week, uh, you know, they, they still have huge insecurities about their life, their jobs, the people that they work with that they're scared of, you know, so... That's, I guess that's, that's for us has always been the focus. Do you, do you think that we're, and I mean, sort of not just us three, but just all football fans are quite guilty of forgetting that footballers are just people. I mean, even recently, obviously, not to get political, but the way they were kind of scapegoats at the beginning oh. with the whole NHS donations and stuff and taking wage cuts. Do you think that in some ways this show, because it actually... Not to give it too much sort of profundity, because obviously it is a quite an irreverent comedy, but it did make me reassess how I kind of perceive footballers. Because it's so easy for us on the terraces, isn't it? Just to shout and hurl abuse and expect so much of these people. But they are just human beings. And I thought that was something you guys tried to get into in this, which I think you did really well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks. I, mean, I think I had, a, I had quite a long row on WhatsApp about with my school friends when the football thing came out. About, about them, you know, Matt Hancock having to go about footballs. I was like, why... Why, you know, suggest that these players are any worse than anyone else in a high-earning job? And it's because, you know, that sort of visibility. But it's, you know, it's young men who broadly haven't asked for, for that money. It's because that's the money that exists in the world now, you know. And also, but they, you know, now I'm saying that their job insecurity, if you, if you want to leave your job, you can leave your job. You can run out your contract or you can break your contract and leave. You, you're a footballer. You can't. You can't go, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm being really badly bullied at Spurs, I'm going to leave tomorrow. You're like, well, I'm lucky, you've got three-year contracts, you're not going anywhere. Or, unless we decide, in which case you are, you are definitely going. So I think, yeah, I think, I think that was, I don't think we were trying to rehabilitate footballers necessarily. I think we were more trying to humanise the players as characters so you could laugh with them and, in, and enjoy it, really. But I'm glad that that has come across, because that was, that was an intention, I think. Yeah, how much research had to go into the kind of behind the scenes culture of football clubs? Because I mean, obviously, we all know so much. There's only so much fans are actually privy to when it comes to that. Yeah. Kind of thing. And we are quite lucky these days of Instagram stories and stuff. We're starting to get more of an insight, I think, into how they operate and what it's like in the changing rooms. But did you guys have to go to any training grounds or meet any players when you were writing this? Yeah, we ended up, I mean, we're very lucky. Um, people were very generous with their time. So we got invited to. Um, training facilities for Premier League clubs, for Championship clubs. Um, we've been to meet chairmen and interview them. And, you know, it's fascinating. I think like most sort of walks of life, and people are quite eager to, to give you the true picture, I think, about what, you know, what the world's like. So that was quite refreshing. And actually, um, as a football fan, I can say, I mean, one of the things that I sort of hate about the way football fandom has developed and evolved is the way that we are now have to get annoyed about the financial deals <laughs> or the meals, uh, you know, basically things that really have no impact whatsoever, really, on the team. But, you know, everybody now becomes an expert in, in those fields. So it was quite nice to go into actual experts and see them in their workplace and it makes you realize that all that kind of pontificating on fan tv uh is just the hot air that you always suspected it was no one's privy to information it doesn't quite operate like we all think it does they're all really professionally run these people are 
well-paid professionals doing a good job in the main. Because yeah. <laughs> I was wondering too about the, um, I mean, I love the, the cast and particularly the lead, the, the lead trio that are brilliant, but I was wondering about the casting. I mean, obviously um, with the Inbetweeners, I mean, it was a great, you, it, went, it went relatively unknown in, in the leading four, which obviously was, it served it so well and they, they've all gone on to, to be so successful. Was, in, in this instance, was it always the case as well to try and find relative unknown to those leading roles? And you must have been thrilled with the, the leading trio that you did get. Yeah, I mean, they, it's, I guess what was very exciting about working with the three leads, um, so Jake Shaw, um, Shaquille Ali Yabua, I hope I'm saying that correctly, I've just, I've just had enough practice, yeah. um, and, um, oh, the other guy, Jack. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> but but they, uh, I think when we were making the in-betweeners, there was a day very early on after we cast them, and it was a very exhaustive process, a bit, like that for the first team really and that's just because Ian and I like to see everyone and we see something in everyone but um, there was a day with the in-betweeners casting where I remember we were in for an audition for the first time and they were hanging out and you know you just got a sense you're like these guys they're gonna get on they're funny they look funny together and I felt like that very early on in the room we have a rehearsal week before we go and shoot and it was the first time we managed to get them all in the room together and it was really apparent at that stage that they you know they were I you know they they loved working, love the opportunity of doing that show and being given a chance to, to play footballers. They understood football, but they really did bond very early on. So, um, it, you know, that was, that's always exciting, I think, when you're casting. For us, it's one of the highlights of the process. And then when you get to work with, you know, the big, you know, big comedy legends like Will Arnett and Chris Gear, and I mean, that's just sort of competition winning time for us. We, you know, we're very privileged, lucky ourselves to, to be able to, to work with people like that. And you've both spoken in the past, um, when, when in times I've met you as well, about how much of yourselves you put into the in-betweeners and how there was kind of... You, and I just wondered about, in this instance, were there, were, were there any characters, any specifics of themes and stuff that you felt were quite resonant with, with yourselves? Because I know that's obviously the case in all kind of comedy writers. They put a lot of themselves into it. But you guys, whenever we've spoken in the past, when you spoke about the in-betweeners, always seemed to, to make a real point of the fact that there were a lot of yourselves in the character. And I just wonder if that's the case here too. I think it's slightly different, but I think there's, <clears throat> I think we both operate with a level of insecurity. And I think, <clears throat> so I've got terrible COVID today, I'll get that somewhere. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, we, we, there's a level of insecurity that I think you have as a writer. And there's, you know, and I think we could, there's an analogy for that in football. And the idea of putting yourself out there, you know, creating something and putting it out there and seeing what people think. I think there's a certain level of performance that, it goes with what we do uh, as well as football, which is understandable. And then again, I think the sort of fame aspect of, of the footballers, a lot of that was related to us hanging out with the guys from the Inbetweeners and seeing how their lives changed and what their lives were like and how people on the street would treat them for good or bad. Yeah, no, I think we did discover that uh, as we were doing that research, there is an awful lot of crossover, you know, a lot of similarities because I've seen in this business, People, you know, if you do something well, you will get enabled to do it. And that doesn't excuse sort of starry behaviour, I guess. But I did, you know, you do understand it more when you work in this industry because you think, well, I can see that they don't court that. That just happens. And footballers are the same. If you're really good at football, people start doing stuff for you. And they, start, you know, because they want to take away the pressure of um, you having to think about anything else other than the thing that you really are good at. And so, yeah, we, I think there are parallels that we could relate to because we've seen a lot of that in our own industry and then everything else to do with the world of football and tropes of football you know the football that we all enjoy and have followed in this country really and how it's reported on um fans and journalists alike it's all been through our brains you know everything comes in and comes out the other side so whenever we're thinking about this show it's all going through this sort of you know the washing machine of having lived through the last uh, what is it 30 20 years of the premier league yeah, so years. 20 years of it being big on tv for 30 years isn't it now going up to so yeah uh, you know a lot i guess that's where our own sort of writer's dna might get fused into it and I mean, when obviously with the, with the in-betweeners, it, was, it became, so it, it actually got ingrained into just pop culture, just everyday life. I mean, there were, there were lines that you guys penned and wrote that people are still saying all the time. And every time I go past the bus stop, you must have had this, <laughs> but you do think everyone's saying at the bus stop is a bus stop wanker, the bus wanker, sorry. It's just, it's, you have these kind of lines that really, it broke through and it came into the public conscience. I was just wondering if when writing a new sitcom, if you have to sort of try and forget that, 
and try and just because because it could be so easy to tr to think about well these lines worked and these are the things that became so popular in the last thing we wrote do you almost have to just completely ignore everything that was successful about the last one to avoid trying to sort of force it into into this and write lines that might you might not have naturally have written uh, in the first place yeah i think I don't, I don't think we wrote anything in the in-between is thinking that people would repeat it ever <laughs> or no. yeah so it wasn't like it wasn't that hard to not do it again if that makes sense it wasn't like oh, we better put a thing in here it's gonna become a catchphrase i don't think we thought you know with, with the in-betweeners i mean to be fair the difference one of the differences between this and the in-betweeners was that when we wrote the in-betweeners a lot of it a lot of the, the sort of overarching theory of what we wanted to write and this is damon's idea more than mine was about language and how language works at that age and how you're testing the boundaries of what you can and can't say and who you can say it to but also how small groups of people create their own languages i mean they own their own you know they have their own catchphrases and their own things amongst you amongst your group of friends really and so that's what we were trying to write it was about a group of friends who had their own way of talking to each other and as it happened people liked that way of talking and they used some of them so it wasn't i don't think there was that same we didn't we didn't write that we didn't write them to be catchphrases, we wrote them to make sense of a circle of friends. And then this, they're not really, they all come from such disparate areas, that it, doesn't, it wasn't really an issue. Yeah, well, I was gonna, I think I've said this before about, you know, with the in-betweeners, it's very difficult to top for us. It's kind of, it's, it's hit rate in terms of, you know, high impact one-liners, because those four characters are almost, designed to say every they're shock machines aren't they so every time they open their mouths they're going to try and say something shocking or certainly three of them and and i think that it you know it's very difficult to sort of recreate that in any other sphere of life or walk of life other than you know the sixth form common room and uh, a, prison, a prison might be the next thing we do prison yeah it wouldn't be as funny would it you know it'd be kind of harrowing i guess in <laughs> So, so yeah, we don't go into it thinking we could ever match that. Really, I guess we just want, you know, we want uh, the characters to feel real and people to connect with them. And you know, hopefully, I mean, we've got a character in this show, which, without giving too much away, is uh, is shy. That's one of his lead traits, which is quite a difficult thing to pull off. We sort of discovered in writing, and you're trying to do a comedy character who uh, who's main trait seems to be shyness so we play around with things like that if that connects and hits then you know that 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 for us would be very rewarding it'll be interesting to see how that goes i don't think we went into the in-between as thinking any of these things that they say will be repeated or imitated because at the time you know we didn't even know if anyone was going to watch it so i think yeah, we're quite I Somebody, I think it might have been Will Arnett said to us he's going oh this bit this bit will be memed this bit will be memed if we were like i was like what and I was like, oh, maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's the equivalent of, um, you know, of the, of the catchphrases now is things being memed. But they tend to be, as I understand, they tend to be memed with like other things written under them. So you're just like, oh, yeah, well, we shot that. But you put something totally different, totally new joke yeah. underneath. Well, we made a show, our company made a show called Enterprise uh, with a brilliant uh, writer performer called Coyote Iwumi. And he... Um, he, before he'd done that, we made some shorts with him, which was based on an original idea he'd developed and made to the internet, and they made for PC3, um, about his, char his character, Roll Safe, who was a young sort of like grime artist, who was, uh, they made a kind of like mockumentary about him and, and his sort of struggle to convince the documentary team that he was going to be the next big thing. Within that, he did one thing uh, in, a, in a scene where he came outside, just being, he's on a date with a girl, and he comes out and he taps his forehead and he goes, ah, always thinking like this that has been memed across the world now it's called the thinking man meme oh yeah i don't that. know where that came from That's that true. is from a show that we made and like you, just, that, you know you never know how these things go so kind can go anywhere in the world and he has Everyone got just going like that recognition true. factor yeah <laughs> it's like they won't know it's role safe necessarily all the time they just you know that thing went viral and on its own anyway but i mean it's just weird that you could go to middle america and he gets stopped in the street. Goes the thinking man. <laughs> I've used that meme many a time as well. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so funny, but it's because he's so funny. Like that, sure, his face. He's a brilliant comic actor, and it's because his face. And you're like, yeah, that is really funny. It's, again, it's a brilliant encapsulation. That it's like I watched that Matt Lucas thing the other day. Him doing Boris Johnson. Brilliant, that is. <laughs> I, I must have watched it twenty times in a row, and I watched it again because I was like, 
that you know he's so funny like he's so, what he's doing with the words and the backstory he's creating from those words is so amazing Oh God, it was just like, it was like watching, it's like a comic masterclass in 17 seconds, I thought. It was amazing. Well, Matt Lucas, obviously not just that, but I saw him and uh, David Williams did a kind of a, a Little Britain at home thing, which was really good. Wasn't it fantastic? I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering about like, and I've, this is bringing out a lot of creativity this time, particularly in comedians. Mm. So I was just wondering what, what, you, what you two have been, have been doing, and you're probably now going to tell me nothing. So, but, but like, Absolutely just, nothing. You, I mean, we're yin, yin and yang here, because yeah. I've done absolutely nothing. I mean, I've literally poured over words, you know, like two pages of, of A4 that I've typed, uh, you know, for about, well, it feels like six months now. I'm not really getting anywhere. I've got nothing. The tank is dried. I think Ian Morris is out there just churning out. It's been unbelievable. I've been, it's been incredible. I've got through so much stuff. But the trouble is, I had my, my mother-in-law was staying with me, so I had childcare until Saturday. And I got so much done. And now she's gone, so I'm done for. Like, I'm absolutely done for. Like, yeah, I've been three days of trying to look after my son and my daughter with help and my wife and everything. And it's not, this has been dropping. Yeah, no, I've been, I think the thing is that, you know, whether you're writing or performing, you're a show off, really, aren't you? And what you want is you want to get things out to people to show people to have recognition back. And, with social media and stuff these days, you don't really need to do that in front of a live audience. You can just do that and then send it to them and then they can get back to you about how much they love you. And so it, I think if we didn't have a show coming out, I would definitely be spending even more time trying to think of ways I could show off online. But uh, I'm mainly working on my first album of... Um... <laughs> I've taught myself to play That's Entertainment on the piano, which, by the way, is not a great way to play that's entertainment it's better on the guitar that's why <laughs> <laughs> but there is a weird balance is it because some just from my side of, of the industry and people writing and reviewing and stuff like that is there is a weird balance of some people using this time to be like super creative and other people are finding there to be real futility and kind of finding really real struggle to yeah. sit down and be creative so it's, it's, it's a balance but um I was I wondering, the thing is that uh, for me I, I've always taken futility as meaning well there's no fucking point in anything so you might as well just do something yes rather than if they put anything they don't do anything yeah. Um, I was wondering too, just because obviously I've got free license here to talk about football, which is always nice because I'm, I'm yeah. usually told not to talk about football when I do it. <laughs> uh, just wondering about. Uh, yeah, Spurs as well, if you want, Stefan. So, so I suppose, yeah. <laughs> well, I as well. um, I'm just wondering about if you guys are missing football and if you're sort of looking forward to the return of it and if you hope that there's a chance we might go back in with um, a fresh pair of eyes. Because I'm not going to lie to you, the last year I've, with VAR and stuff, I really I felt my maybe and the fat Spurs got rid of Pochettino, hired Mourinho. I really started to feel a disconnect between myself and football. And do you think that in this kind of period where we're getting quite nostalgic and we're watching lots of reruns and stuff, do you think there's a chance we might go back in with more enthusiasm? VAR, honestly, I, I I've had it. It's been the best. It broke my heart because the best season QPR I've had for, like, in my opinion, for certainly for ten years. I've loved watching this group of players more than I've watched, I even probably more than I like watching the Tar out the years, but I, I've loved it so much. And also, one of the great joys of the championship is no VAR. And when you watch, I watch a lot of Premier League games, because on TV here a lot, and then, you know, you watch the championship. It's so much better than I have VAR. It's so much better. It changes everything. And, you, and it's when you, you flip back and you watch the championship, when you go live to the championship game, you're like, this is great. This is like, it's... it's and then you watch the... Pre I, I've almost stopped watching the Premier League you know, I, I like watching Liverpool because of Tom Werner, but really, I'm like, I don't, I don't see any. The VAR has just has kind of put the last nail in the coffin for me. But, but this is, it's broken up. This season of QPR, I really like. They, they're such a great group of players. They've been playing such great football. Oh, it's been great. Anyway, from a purely selfish point of view, I have not missed football at all because I'm an Arsenal fan, and it feels like <laughs> the last. I mean, we've, you know, the last sort of feels like decade, but certainly the last five years, it's ruined so many of my weekends. I mean, <laughs> as well. I know that's the contract, and, and I love the contract, by the way. It is the, I mean, you know, if anyone doesn't understand football, this, it, it, you know, the, you know, and I guess the equivalent is discovering like a drug that gives you a high that you can't ever match in your life apart from taking that drug again but you it might only work once every decade like you might only get a high again but when you have it you you'll go through so much and and so not not having that kind of uh, mercurial um sort of bio rhythm to life 
so you don't have ru weekends ruined by football. It's been really nice, but now it's just ruined by Boris Johnson. So like, <laughs> he's replaced that for me. I do want to add, by the way, I, knew, I was going to say, I knew Ian was a QPR fan. I didn't actually know you were Arsenal. This isn't me trolling. I had no, I actually didn't know you were an Arsenal fan, Dave. To be honest, well, he likes Arsenal. you've missed the window to troll me as a Spurs fan. You had about <laughs> five years of good times. So you can't do it now. So no. I'm, I'm, I'm back on terra firma. I'm like, well, at least that's one thing that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> the not the natural order, to be honest, because we're both rubbish. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't great when, you know, the sands had shifted. <laughs> So, but yeah, you know what I mean about that. And on the other hand, I I miss it dearly because it's uh, you know it's part of part of me. I think football. I'm to, I've been going to Arsenal since you know not the so good. Arsene Wenger started. It's so so I mean, it's bizarre to not be going to football matches at the weekend um, and you know arguing with people about. Uh, whether we have good commercial deals or the arms <laughs> is we're getting enough out of that from from yeah. the Rwandans. I'm not sure. I should though counteract this football chat by just pointing out that I watched uh, the first team with my wife, who's not a big football fan, and she thought oh, it was absolutely hilarious. So it's definitely good. got great. You, you can tell it's got you know universal appeal outside of good. football oh, fans. I just wanted to chat to you about football quickly. Um, but my final question, because I don't know how long mm. I've got, but I'm sure I've gone way yeah, over, um, was just about um, the. I mean, obviously, the, obviously, the in between us had a, a few series and movies. But with the first team, obviously, it's very early days. It's only it's not even been shown yet. But have you already had discussions and thought about series two and where you could take these characters in this group of players? Yeah, series two. Yeah, I mean, obviously, even when we're writing series one, we are thinking about where where this takes them and 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 things that we'd like to already explore. Because I think at the beginning of this series, you see that Matty has been signed from America by the owner, who's sort of gone out on a limb and and uh, you know he's a new, he's a new chairman in the Premier League. He's American and he's decided to buy an American um, for the team because he thinks that would be a good business move. He hasn't really checked out. The right, whether, you know, whether he's even allowed to do that or whether he's got the right player. So that's something that kind of gets a bit past at the beginning of the series because we wanted that to come back for, for season two. Um, and, I, and Ian and I were saying earlier that we, you know, that while it's about the football, while, sorry, while it's about the humans really and, and the dressing room and the players and we don't talk too much about the football, there is a natural arc to it and they do, you know, go through a season and take it to the end of the season. So... Uh, where we leave them, it'd be fascinating to pick up the next season because we leave them in a, in a pretty, in, you know, where we find them in a state of flux, we leave them back in that state, I, I, I think. Yeah, I like the idea of every season they just sort of go down and down and down. So by <laughs> season five, they're just playing Sunday League, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your no, time today, you. guys. Nice it's been your um, Jake, I was going to say actually, just just as a side, I mean, it's a great time, isn't it, in some ways, for this to be released? Because not only is the whole nation missing football, but we're all desperate for a laugh. So it's been an accidental touch of a masterstroke, I think, getting this out soon. So, well, it, it took us a while. We got they got the COVID. We went to Wuhan for six months. Worked with some guys out there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. managed, to, managed to come up with something. Yeah. <laughs> Damon was doing the Damon was doing the natural side. He was eating bats and pangolins, and, and I was in I was in the lab with the guys. And uh, between the two of us, we managed to work something out. When we released the first In Between Us movie, it was pretty bleak at that time in yeah. British society. They were like riots that summer, and everyone was like, right. "Are you going to yeah. be allowed to release a film in the cinema?" So, uh, yeah, maybe you know, maybe we've got that kind of curse of the Simpsons. Whenever anything comes out, in fact, when I released White Gold the first season, that might have been the most turbulent six weeks in British public life because we had. Terrorist attacks, it was the Manchester bombing, Grenfell Tower, an election, the London Bridge terrorist attack. So I just be safe. I'd say everyone can stay safe out there yeah. when a show from one of us comes yeah. out. Yeah, it's that it's Aaron Ramsey worry. thing, isn't it? Every time Aaron Ramsey scores and someone famous dies, it's the same. Every time yeah, you guys find a six true, yeah. <laughs> um, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I should probably head off because I know this meeting's going to run out. But it was good to speak to you both again. And good to see yeah, you, Ian's not in a talk sports studio at 2 a.m. or whatever it was last time. I know, it was <laughs> late. With, I've been out with Joe Thomas that night. It was fun when me and Joe Thomas have been out drinking champagne. When I went to the. <laughs> Um, no. And hopefully for series two, we'll be able to do this in person, which would be good. Yeah, yeah that would be lovely. Brilliant. Great All right, thanks, so thanks guys. for that. Bye. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys.
Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey!